Hi, my name is Mark, and I'm doing this review of Gloomhaven, this monstrosity of a board game here. It seems that a lot of the videos and reviews out uh, about this game, and there are quite a few, are by and for hardcore board gamers playing regularly. If you already have a twice-weekly board game group that meets, you already know about Gloomhaven, you've probably already played it. But while I hope everyone enjoys this video, this is specifically for casual gamers. Somebody who maybe occasionally plays board games and might have heard about this or maybe hasn't but stumbled across this review and is curious if this is something you might like. By way of introduction and where I'm from, I enjoy board games. I always have. Grew up with my family playing them. We still play games um, when we get together. I'm never someone who's been a hardcore gamer playing weekly or even on a monthly basis. Actually, once I started playing Gloomhaven is kind of the first time I've actually had a regular gaming group. That's kind of where I'm coming from. And a lot of the other board games that people who were reviewing this were sort of comparing to, I had never even heard of. Um, which is why I thought a video like this might be useful to other people. I found out about Gloomhaven on 538, which is Nate Silver's site, and as an aside, if you're not reading that, it's awesome. They do great analysis and statistical modeling of everything from sports to politics to, yes, even they talk about board games. And a couple of years back, um, they were doing a story. There's a site called Board Game Geek. Board Game Geek works like Amazon reviews. If you've played a game, you can go online and give it a ranking, and then they aggregate all the ranking. And they actually think of board games pretty widely, so it includes card games, things like tic-tac-toe, like everything you can imagine and they were doing this story looking at kind of how those community ratings work this new game at the time Gloomhaven um, had pretty quickly risen up the rankings and actually rose to the number one spot out of all the thousands of games they have ranked so I read that article that I came to through 538 and saw this and I was like you know I like games this game sounds kind of interesting I read a couple reviews and I'm like this is apparently considered by the hardcore gamers, who are the people who are going online to a site like Board Game Geek and reviewing games, mostly, had gotten this ranking as the top game of all time. It was intriguing to me that this pretty new game had made it to the number one spot out of all these games, and I was like, I'm curious, I want to give it a shot. And a year later, here I am making a video about it. I'll be honest, I love this game. This is the first game of any sort board game, card game, video game that I've ever felt compelled to actually sort of evangelize to people about and tell them they should be playing it. And also the first thing I've ever wanted to make a video about it. Now that said, as much as I like it, I also know there are some things um, about my own particular taste that make me like it and also some things that might make other people not enjoy it. I've had the chance to play this with a wide variety of different people, some of whom have really loved it and some have found it's not their cup of tea. I'm trying to pinpoint aspects that might be appealing or not to the casual gamer and hopefully give you insight into whether it's something that would fit your taste or not. You know your own tastes and can hear these things and figure out like, okay, yeah, this sounds like a game I would like, um, or no, some of those things are deal breakers, this sounds like it would not be a good fit for me. So I'm evangelizing about the game. Uh, with the sort of caveat that I know not everybody is going to like it and I want people who are going to like it to find it and people who aren't going to like it to not waste their time and do something else you'll enjoy more. To give you a sense of my taste, some of my other favorite games um, besides Gloomhaven would be Pandemic, Rivals for Catan, the two-player card game, Uno, if I'm in a big group of people, is still a fun one to play. I was a long-time Settlers of Catan fan, which is probably a game that many people are familiar with, one that sort of started in the more uh, gaming community and crossed over to get pretty uh, mainstream appeal. Although I'll say I've kind of moved on from that. I like some of the expansions, like Cities and Knights, better than the original, but those are kind of... Um, where I'm coming from in terms of the games that I've played and I've enjoyed. Okay, as I mentioned, I'm not going to give a overview of the um, whole game or the game mechanics because there's way too much to cover there and there are a lot of other videos that d do that well. I do think it's probably relevant in case this is the first time you're hearing about this game to just tell you a little bit about what it is and kind of how it works. Thematically, it's a dungeon crawler. It's in a world where different sorts of species and monsters and stuff exist and magic exists and all that sort of thing. There are a bunch of uh, characters who go into a dungeon or a crypt or some old ruins or whatever and are trying to achieve these particular objectives. So th thematically, you can kind of think of it as like a Dungeons and Dragons. Um, but it does not play like a Dungeons and Dragons. It's a very different type of game than that. When you hear Dungeon Crawler, you might be thinking of sort of a hack and slash sort of, you know, 
go in with your sword, hack, hack, hack at some monsters like a video game, fast-paced sort of thing like that. This is actually not that type of a game. It's more of a hand management game. Here's what I mean by a hand management game and how this affects your strategy. All of my cards that I can play to do actions have a couple different things they can do. So they have something I can do on the top and something they can do on the bottom. Whenever I do one of those actions and play that card, it's no longer in my hand and I can't play it. Now there are ways through the game to recover cards and bring things back to your hand, but also some cards get sort of permanently lost and you can't use them again. So a lot of the game is about the strategy of what cards do I want to play when, if I'm going to lose this card, I better get something good out of it because as you gradually go through the game, you're losing more and more of your cards and eventually you run out of cards and you're exhausted and can't play anymore. So other things to know about the game. Uh, first, it's a legacy game. If you're not familiar with that term, it means that events you do in one gaming session affect the next. If I'm playing with my group this week, whatever decisions we make at this point, will also affect what happens when we play next week. This is not what you're probably used to in casual board games. If I play a game of Monopoly and somebody wins it, when we go to play the next game, it doesn't matter who won the previous game or how they had played or what had happened in it, we're basically starting fresh. That's not the case here. If you picked up an item or a treasure in one scenario, you can use that in the next scenario Maybe at one point in the game, there's two different scenarios you could play. And if you play and beat one of them, it actually locks the other one and you're never gonna be able to play that one, but it opens up some different scenarios instead. So it's kind of a little bit like a choose your own adventure. Sometimes you'll be able to go back and try the path not taken. And sometimes going down one path, you'll never be able to get back to the first one. Each gaming session is built around what's called a scenario. So there's some map, with some monsters in it, and the characters are gonna go in and try to achieve some objective. It might be killing the monsters, it might be finding something, it might be getting to a certain point in the map. And they're trying to achieve that goal, and that's the scenario, and that would be like a gaming session. And the game comes with 95 different scenarios. There's also a way to build some random new scenarios included in it as well. And if you were you know, getting together with your gaming group one evening um, to play, you'd probably play a scenario or maybe two scenarios Whatever they've done during that will have an impact on what happens in future gaming sessions over the course of what's called a campaign, which would be the length of the entire game. One thing to note about this being a legacy game is it's a single playthrough. So as you play through the game, things are changing, you're using up some things, and when you eventually complete the whole campaign, you theoretically would be done with this game. You would have to like buy another one or something like that. So it's not something that has infinite uses. On the other hand, you get a lot of play out of it, which I'll talk about a little bit later. I should also be clear that just because it's a legacy doesn't mean there's never a feeling of completion or ending. Each scenario has a goal. You play it through to an ending where you win, you know, where you win or lose that scenario um, and accomplish something. That's kind of the closure of that chapter. Um, but then whatever the implications of that were will go on into the next time you play. Okay, another thing to know about the game is that it is cooperative. All the players are working together towards a common goal, so you're basically playing against the game itself. The bad guys or monsters in the game are controlled by game rules, whereas you're controlling all your own characters. So this is different than a lot of games. Most games you play are uh, competitive, so if it's Scrabble or Monopoly, or Sari, or Uno, or Settlers of Catan, or whatever, you're trying to win and the other people will lose. Um, in this case, you're all working together to achieve a common goal. So that's my very brief intro to the game. Like I said, there are lots of other reviews and places you can go to find out about the game mechanics and such. I wanna move on to things that you might like or not like about this game to let you know if you should think about buying it or trying to play it. One of those things I've already mentioned is the legacy element. Uh, this is the first legacy game I've played. I've really enjoyed that aspect of it. It really gives you this sense that you are building this larger world and following this larger narrative and seeing what happens in it and that your choices have consequences. And I particularly enjoy how it is done in here. Whether you're leveling up a character or choosing what scenario to play or encountering some event on the road between scenarios or when you're back in the city of Gloomhaven, which is functions kind of like a video game hub um, where you can buy things and stuff like that. Things happen and you're making choices and those choices have consequences that follow through and they have opportunity cost. So as an example, 
when I am leveling up a character, part of that is I get to add another card to my pool. So another ac action card that has different actions on it I can do, and so I'll have some new actions available to me. But there are always more cards to choose from than I can actually pick. So I might get to pick one, but I have a couple options, and whatever one I don't pick there, I never get to add. So I'm sort of choosing this path and not that one, and it's setting me down this direction in a way that um, is going to carry through the rest of the game. I think that's really cool. It really makes you sort of feel some of the weight of these decisions and that there's strategy to those aspects as well, and you're thinking about what to do. Um, there are even things like you, you're on the road and you encounter a battle, and you have, your group has to decide, do we join in on this side or do we join in on that side? And you don't have all the information, you're operating off of what you have, but each of those choices will have some consequence. Something good or something bad will happen to your party based on what you do, and that will have consequences for the rest of the game. So that legacy aspect I think is really cool. Another aspect of the game, kind of related to the legacy elements, but I'm going to actually count as a separate thing, is there are a lot of surprises. The game t comes with a ton of content, and a lot of it is not available to you at the beginning, but gets unlocked as you achieve various things over the course of the campaign. So for instance, there are 17 different characters you can play in the game, and they all play differently, which is cool. But there's only six that you start with access to. So your initial group of people has to choose from those six. And then as you achieve certain things, new characters become unlocked. And so you could choose to play as a different kind of character. There are also you know, booklets and envelopes with information and stuff that comes in the game sealed. And you don't get to open them until you reach a certain point and have achieved certain objectives. So sort of as the game keeps going, even over a long period of time, it's continually adding new stuff to it. You're getting access to new characters. You're getting new information about the narrative story that's going on in the big picture. And there's just always some more surprises. You're always finding new things. Even the fact that your characters can level up and add new cards means if you're playing a bunch of scenarios as the same character, um, that character themselves is changing. They're getting some new abilities. They're getting rid of old abilities. And so it never really gets stale with all these surprises, which I think is cool. Now, just to be clear, I have to stress that the gameplay itself is fun, at least to me. I enjoy it a lot. So actually playing a scenario and figuring out what cards you're going to play, seeing what your teammates are doing, what the monsters are doing, how you're going to win this scenario, figuring out all that is really enjoyable and would be a good enough game in and of itself. Um, in fact, the game actually includes a mechanism for creating random scenarios if you just want to sort of jump in, not play as part of a campaign, and just, hey, I want to play this character today, let's do a random scenario that doesn't affect our main gameplay. You can do that and just play it kind of like a regular one-off board game. All the legacy elements and surprises wouldn't be worth anything if the gameplay itself was tedious and felt like a chore to get through just to unlock the next thing. Um, the fact is that's not the case. The gameplay itself is really fun and enjoyable, a really good strategy game. It just has this added bonus on top of it that, hey, when you finish that scenario, there's also long-term effects that come into play based on what you did there. And so you have this larger story that each of these scenarios is fitting into. One good example of how the um, regular gameplay itself is enhanced by the legacy elements and actually makes it better is the diversity of characters. So I mentioned there are 17 different characters, um, some of which are available at the beginning, some of which have to be unlocked in the game. Um, what's cool is they all play really differently, right? This isn't like, you know, you're playing Monopoly and you're choosing the hat or the car or the boat because you like how it looks, but they all have exactly the same thing happening. Each character has its own kind of cards, its own kinds of actions. Some characters have more hit points. Some characters can move better. Some characters can attack better. Some characters have magic abilities. That to me is one of the cool things that even as you're playing through multiple scenarios, the game itself keeps changing with some of these legacy mechanics and keeps things fresh and interesting and allowing you to try different ways of playing. One other item worth noting about Gloomhaven's legacy aspect, and I don't necessarily know that it's a pro or a con, but just something that's kind of different from most games you're used to, is because as you go through the game, you're unlocking different content, characters, leveling up in different ways, and other people playing might have made different choices, this is not a game that you can kind of jump between different copies of the game easily. So um, if you have a group of people you're playing with, you want to kind of 
all be playing on the same board every time. So if you had a group that was moving around the house to house, somebody would want to bring the game with them to each one so you're playing on the same copy. It also makes it a little weird. Um, most games, if you know how to play, everyone kind of jump right in and everybody knows the rules. So if I go over to my friend's house and they say, oh, you want to play Yahtzee? I've played Yahtzee. You know, we can jump right in and play the rules and everything's going to be exactly the same. If I'm playing a Gloomhaven campaign and I'm visiting some friends who are playing their own Gloomhaven campaign and they say, hey, do you want to play a scenario with us? I certainly can. I know the rules and how everything's going to work. Um, but it might be a little trickier to jump right in. If we want to play in a campaign mode, I'd have to create my own character to go in their campaign. They might have different characters or abilities or perks unlocked than I have, so I might lose some things that I'm used to playing with or have access to some things that I haven't played with before. Maybe there's something that I haven't unlocked yet, it's unlocked on their game and sort of spoils a little bit of that surprise for me seeing what's coming up ahead. Um, so it's not to say you can't do it, but it's a, a little different than most board games in that it's something where you really kind of just want to be playing on one copy of the game. Okay, another thing I like about this game is that it's a pseudo-cooperative. So I mentioned earlier that it is cooperative, everyone's playing together to achieve the same goal, um, but it's not quite 100% cooperative. So for instance, in a given scenario, there's the goal that all of us are trying to achieve. You know, let's say it's kill this monster. But everybody also has their individual goals they're trying to achieve. Sometimes those things come into conflict, right? So there might be a point where, boy, I could do this thing that would help out the team here, but I could also do this thing that will really help me get closer to my character's own goals. And you have to make those choices. And that balance I, I find pretty unique. I haven't seen a lot of other games that play with that. They tend to be either strictly competitive or strictly cooperative. And here it's a, it's a little bit of both. It's mainly cooperative, you're all working together, but there are times when you're, the goals of the different characters might differ and that adds a little uniqueness to the strategy. Maybe there's some treasure to pick up and you know there's a couple different players who each want to get that for themselves and how do they balance that with whatever they're trying to achieve as a team. This actually gets at one of the larger things I think Gloomhaven does very well, which is blend the best aspects of a lot of different elements of games. So there's the fact that it's mostly cooperative with a little bit of competitive or selfish strategy to it as well. There's a little bit of role playing, but not fully that way. There's um, a lot of hand management, but also some things that aren't just a sort of card game. It, it has a good mix of a lot of things. One of the best examples of this blend to me is kind of the way that it blends strategy and luck. So there are some games that are basically all strategy. They're completely solved. If you know what you're doing, you will always win or tie if the other person knows what they're doing. So let's say something like checkers or tic-tac-toe is a really simple example. That's all strategy. There's no luck. It's completely um, foreseen. Chess would be another good example. Um, obviously, that's a really complicated game, but there's no luck, it's all strategy. If you're playing against somebody who's really good and you are not, they will always win and vice versa. On the other side, you have games that are pretty much all luck. So, you know, obviously something where you're like just literally randomly rolling dice like craps or something is luck. But even something like Monopoly, where there is kind of a clear best strategy, but it's so much dependent on luck and what properties you land on and roll that it's really more of a luck game than a strategy game. I think Gloomhaven does a really good job of balancing those two. So it's mostly strategy. You got to have a good, good plans, good sense of what you're doing. The scenarios are hard, hard enough that it's virtually impossible to win with a bad strategy or if you're doing stupid things. You got to be smart. But it's not completely predictable. There's a little bit of luck thrown in. So I mentioned before there's no dice, but there are things like um, every time you're doing an attack, there's a little set of deck of cards you flip over that can modify your attack and maybe it gets a little stronger, maybe it gets a little weaker, but you can't predict exactly how good an attack it was going to be. There's also things like the actions that the monsters do are also you know, drawn from a deck and maybe most of the time this kind of monster does the same thing but then you're halfway through the deck and suddenly it does something you weren't expecting and you have to adjust your plans. So I really like that aspect that it rewards strategy, it requires you to think and plan with your team and figure out what you're gonna do, uh, but it's not entirely predictable. You can have a great strategy and maybe you just get that one really unlucky card at just the wrong time and it blows up your strategy and you gotta do something totally different. Um, 
So it's not 100% predictable, but not really based on luck. And I think it does a really good job balancing between those two. Something else I think is pretty cool about this is that there isn't really a right or wrong way to play a particular character. There are some characters that lend themselves better to one style of play than another, um, but they all allow some flexibility. What this means is there's not really an optimal strategy, like this is the right way to play a character. You'll see two different people take vastly different approaches to how they play one of these characters, and they both work, and they're kind of finding, okay, here's what this character can do, here's their strengths, here's their weaknesses, and here's how this blends with the way I like to play, and they find um, something that's sort of this amalgamation of the character and themselves and sort of the play style. I like that this game allows you to try out different strategies and play characters in different ways and play different characters that themselves play in different ways, and it doesn't punish you for that. You actually um, kind of get rewarded for thinking about that because maybe based on the particular scenario you're playing and what the goal is or what monsters are going to be in there or who else is on your team, you want to play that character differently. You know, maybe I have a character that is kind of good at a couple things um, and if there's somebody else on my team who's really good at one of those, maybe I want to focus on doing the other thing. On the flip side, if there's nobody on my team who's good at either of those things, maybe I want my character to kind of blend the two of those um, together better. And I'm being a little bit vague so as not to do any sort of spoilers, but the fact is um, that the game allows you to play with the characters and try a lot of different strategies, and there are multiple kind of good ways to play, which I think is a lot of fun. Okay, so those are some of the things that I think are cool aspects of the game that you can decide if you think those are good or not. I want to talk about a few of the things that are sort of cons of this game or negatives for the casual gamer um, so you kind of know how to weigh those as well. First one is that it's pretty complicated. There are a lot of rules and in my experience compared to most other games that a casual gamer would play it is pretty complex. Um, I think the game is well designed in that as you go through the first couple scenarios it sort of builds things in gradually um, so you're not confronted with every possible rule and variation at one time but even several scenarios in still at least once a game there's usually something where like oh how do we do this and have to consult the rule book and look it up usually it's some weird scenario where you know there's two two things we sort of understand that are compete, competing with each other and we're not sure which rule takes precedence so you have to look it up in your first session or two, if there's only one person who's really read all the rules and theoretically knows everything that's going on, that's a lot of pressure on them. There's a lot of times in those first couple games where they might have to stop and look at the rule book and figure out how to do something. Um, so it's kind of slow going at the start, and that's definitely a potential con and something to be aware of. Let's talk about setup for the game, because that is a challenge. There's a, a lot of stuff to this game, and it takes a while to set up and break down each time you want to play. This is a game that if you have a table, you could set it up and just leave it set up on. I would highly recommend it. Here's a video of me setting up for the first scenario. There's no spoilers. This is literally the first thing you would play in the game. Within the setup, there's kind of two components. There's the things you need for every game, so getting your individual characters set up, getting out all the various tokens you need to have available, your element infusion board, and all these other things that kind of go around it. And then there's also the setup time for the individual scenario itself. Now that part you do have to redo for each scenario because each one uses a different set of map tiles, um, different overlays and different monsters for them. So that's always going to take a little bit of time. But if you can have everything else set up and leave it set up in some location so you're just doing the thing specific to that scenario, that will make things go a lot more quickly. I'll also note that I have an organizer to make it easier to find the pieces I want to use. And I've also played the game a bunch before, so I know what I'm doing and what I'm looking for. Again, if this is your first or second time playing or you don't have an organizer, it's going to take even longer to set up. Just like with the rules, it's helpful in setup to have a couple of people who know what they're doing so they can each be working on different parts and get things going faster. But it's still a bit of work in any case and a giant pain if you don't have any kind of organizer. The completed game setup for four players would look something like this. The other three players would still have to get their stuff ready, but we're essentially ready to start at this point. You can see the amount of time this takes. 
you might spend half an hour or 40 minutes of your gameplay time just putting this game up and taking it down afterwards. I should also mention Gloomhaven is not a quick game to play. So on the box, it says that it takes about 30 minutes per player. Um, so that means if you have four players, they're expecting about a two hour game. Um, and I would say that's pretty accurate. The first time you bring somebody in again, they're gonna play a little slower. But even with experienced people, if you have three or four players, you should expect an hour and a half to two hours just to complete one scenario, and that doesn't factor in the setup or takedown time. So if you're looking for a you know quick game, hey, we want to set something up, play it, and be done with it in about an hour, this is not a great game for that. Going along with that, the first game is going to be really rough and really slow. That's a potential con and definitely something I'd say to someone if you're thinking about this game expect to have to play a couple games to get a feel of whether you like it or not. If you've gone ahead and gotten the game and you play the first scenario you're like, man, that was just so slow and we're looking at rules all the time, don't let that sour you. That's kind of normal. You need to get into it a couple games to really figure out what's going on and be able to play it more smoothly. And that's a higher learning curve than there is for a lot of casual games. And so that's a potential con, um, particularly if you're not going to have time to play a bunch of games at the start. Um, if you want something you can just dive, ri dive right into and get going on quickly, um, this is not the right game for that. Also, this co comes into effect a little bit for every individual person who plays. So if you have a new player coming into the game, even if you're a few scenarios in, um, that first game they're playing is going to go slow. First, there's the stuff they have to do in terms of creating a character and um, you know, figuring out which character they're going to play and any items they need to buy and stuff like that, just kind of getting set up to play. And then they're going to play slowly because they're not familiar with all their actions and looking at all their cards and figuring out, okay, what can I do, which ones might pair well with other ones and stuff. And so it goes slow. So another factor that could determine whether Gloomhaven is a good fit for you is just kind of how often you play games. So as I mentioned, playing an individual scenario is fun and that's certainly enjoyable. It's nothing against that. But it's hard to imagine buying this game with the plan of just doing it as a one-off. A lot of the game's uh, kind of unique strengths are the legacy elements to it, so I would think if you're going to buy it and invest time in learning how to play and such, you'd want to at least have the intention of playing it through as a campaign rather than just as a you know, one-off or something you break out once in a blue moon. That could be playing solo. Uh, that's not my personal uh, thing, but I know from reading comments online a lot of people do play through it solo and enjoy that. Or if you have a group of people who are going to get together and play it somewhat regularly and gradually work through the campaign, that really seems more like what it's designed for and where you'd be taking full advantage of this game. Again, not that you can't just play it as a single scenario, but the learning curve for it is pretty high. So this is not something that you know, if you had some friends over for dinner and afterwards someone's like, hey, let's just break out a board game and uh, play a quick game of something. This is not a great game for that. It's going to take a while to um, teach them how to play and you're going to lose a lot of those legacy elements and stuff like that. Um, so if that's your thing, there are other games that are cheaper and simpler and probably better suited to that. This is really best designed for somebody who's going to at least try to work through a campaign over some period of time, ideally with some of the same people. You can swap people in and out of that group. In my own particular gaming group, uh, we rarely play with the same exact group of players multiple times in a row. We're always swapping people in and out depending who's um, free in a particular um, gaming session. It slows things down a little bit if you're continually introducing new people, particularly the first time they play, it is going to go a little slower for them. Um, but I would definitely say that's kind of what this game is better built for. Before I wrap up, I want to address one other factor that I often see uh, listed as a potential con or drawback of Gloomhaven that I don't actually think is, and I want to explain why, and this is the price. The game currently retails for about $100, uh, give or take, depending on if it's on sale and where you're looking. And on the surface, that seems like a lot of money for a game. You can go over to your local uh, Target or Kmart or equivalent store or whatever, and you can find Sorry or Scrabble or any number of other games from your childhood for 10 or 15 bucks. And so in comparison, $100 sounds like a lot. Um, but I don't think it is. And I want to explain why I don't see that as uh, something that should keep you from getting into this game if otherwise it's something you think you would like.
I bought Gloomhaven when it uh, first got mass released, and it was about $140 then. Um, like I said, it's a little cheaper now. And then I also spent uh, about $90 on an organizer. So let's just round up and say I've spent about $250 on one board game. And again, that might seem like a lot, but I'd actually say it's the best board game money I've spent. There's a couple of reasons for that that I want to walk through. First, you get a lot of game for that money. You can see the size of this box here. This ships at 22 pounds, which is a lot of board game. There's a lot of content in here. As I mentioned, there are a lot of different characters. There's lots of unlockable things. Um, and so there's just actually a lot of game to this. So just as a pure, you're getting stuff for your money, you get a lot out of here. If you take a look at uh, the list of everything that comes in the game, you can see just how much is in here. This packing list has over 2,600 items on it. That's a lot. That includes everything from, you know, a tiny little tracker token this big to the whole game board here. So it's not like all of these things are created equal. To give you a sense of how that breaks down, there are about 1,700 cards, um, about 300 small tokens, money, status trackers, things like that, 18 character miniatures, so the actual little standees um, that you play with as your characters, 185 map pieces, which includes 30 large tiles and then over 150 overlays for those, and then over 200 cardboard monster standees, so the bad guys that you're going to fight. That's a lot of stuff. The 1,700 cards alone would make for a giant game, and you have another, you know, about 900 things still to go beyond that. So again, I'm not saying that you should buy a game just because it has a bunch of stuff in it. I am saying the cost doesn't seem unreasonable given how much stuff comes with it. Yes, you're paying $100 for the game, but you're getting as much stuff as would come in half a dozen or a dozen other board games. The next reason I don't think the price of Gloomhaven should be a deterrent is the fact that it's a legacy game. Now, in some sense, this might seem paradoxical because it's a legacy game. You play through it once and then it's done. Um, that should seem to make it less valuable or less worthy of the money since it's not infinitely reusable like a lot of other board games. The difference to me is that those legacy elements not only enhance the game, but keep me coming back to it. This is probably the only board game that I've ever played that after every time I'm done playing, one of the first things I'm thinking about next is when do we get to play Gloomhaven again? Because I want to see you know, what happens next in the story. I want to use some of these things I just unlocked or take advantage of some new cards that my character just acquired. And I always want to move forward and play that next game. Um, I could contrast this with some games that I've had in my closet for years or decades, you know, like Monopoly or Clue. Um, that yes, they were inexpensive, but I've had them a long time and haven't played them half as much as I've played Gloomhaven. So those legacy aspects that keep you coming back to the game and wanting to see what happened next and feeling like you're part of this ongoing thing as opposed to this game that I'll break out once a year, play once, and then throw back in the closet you know, for another year or two. That to me makes it more valuable because I feel like I'm getting my money's worth. I am keep coming back to the game and putting in a lot more hours on it. The final thing I want to bring up as a reason that I don't think that the price of Gloomhaven should be a deterrent is that you actually get a lot of value out of it. And I'm not just talking about the you know amount of stuff you get in the box. I'm talking about sort of entertainment value. If you do the math on this, let's take a look and say, okay, you can play this with one to four characters. They advertise that the getting through a campaign will take you about 150 hours. Your mileage may vary depending on how fast you play. Um, I would say based on my experiences and partly because we swap in and out a lot of different players, it's probably going to be closer to 200 for us. Let's say for sake of argument that on average you have three people playing at a time. So that's 450 hours of gameplay time total, 150 hours for three people. Even if you bought the game at list price like I did when it first came out and you bought an organizer to go along with it, you're still talking about you know maybe 50 cents per hour of entertainment out of that. If you bought it at the $100 price and you only count the cost of the game, you're looking at something you know between 20 and 25 cents per hour. That's a really good entertainment value. I mean, try to think of you know going out to dinner or going to the movies or something and trying to find good entertainment for you know 25 or 50 cents an hour. And even compared with other board games, I don't think it's dramatically out of line. 
So let's take another sort of popular newer game like Settlers of Catan that I've mentioned before that is a very good game. And that lists for about $40 and we'll assume that you're not getting the you know five to six player expansion or the other expansions for it, um, which can add up pretty quickly. I think I probably have a couple hundred dollars invested in Settlers of Catan at this point. But let's say you're spe you know you're spending that $40 and let's say that you're normally playing with a full four players in it. At that same sort of price point for Gloomhaven for the game itself of you know let's say 22 to 25 cents per entertainment hour per person, you have to play about 40 hours or 25 to 30 games of Settlers of Catan to get the same value as you would from the Gloomhaven campaign. Now, if you like Settlers, you may very well play 25 or 30 or more or more games. I'm not saying that one's a bad investment, but I'm saying this isn't really out of line with that same price point. Um, playing this through all the way once. Um, and I would say this is one that encourages me to actually keep coming back to it more often and playing through that. Whereas by the time I hit 20 games of Settlers, um, I wasn't as interested in playing it super regularly anymore. That became one of those that was in the closet that we'd pull out you know, every once in a while when we had some friends over who wanted to play that, but not something we were actively seeking out. So again, compared to other board games or other entertainment options, like, yes, $100 might sound like a lot for a board game, but you're actually getting a lot of entertainment time out of that that I don't think it makes the price at all out of line with what you get. So that's it. Of course, the most important aspect in determining whether to buy or play any game is whether it's fun. And obviously, I think it is. Like I've said, I think it's the best game that I have played. Um, but everyone's taste differs a little bit, which is why I went through this video to hopefully give you some sense of how the game works, what some of the different features are that may or may not appeal to you, so you can decide for yourself. So let me give you a quick recap of those aspects of the game that hopefully would um, help you decide if it's a good fit for you. It's a legacy game with lots of unlockable content and surprises. It's mostly cooperative, but with individual goals sometimes competing with the team goals. There are lots of different characters to it who play differently and lots of different strategies and approaches to playing those that can work. It's mostly strategy based, but with a little bit of luck thrown in, so it's not entirely predictable. It's relatively complex compared to most casual games with a pretty substantial rule set and a lot of little details to be aware of. It has significant setup and takedown time. The first couple of gaming sessions go pretty slow, so it takes a few gameplays to really get into and get playing smoothly. Each copy of the game gradually gets modified in its own way, so it's harder to jump into other people's copies of the game than it would be with most quote-unquote normal board games. It's not a quick game. Most scenarios take well over an hour, and if you have three to four players, you should probably be expecting closer to the two-hour range. Ultimately, to sum it all up, I would say if you like games with a lot of complexity that are heavily strategy based, where there's a lot of different ways you can play them, um, where each round of gaming plays a little bit differently and you can try different things and there's lots of different things you can think about or different approaches, um, it's probably worth giving this game a shot. That's, those are good indicators that you would probably like it. I don't think there's another game quite like this. So there's nothing I can say if you love this game, you'll love Gloomhaven. If you hate this game, you'll hate Gloomhaven. Based on the people I've played with and their experiences, I would say if your favorite games are Pandemic or Dungeons and Dragons or some other role-playing game like that, um, or even Settlers of Catan or Rivals for Catan, the card game, those are good indicators you would probably enjoy this if you played it. If your favorite games are like Yahtzee or Sari or Monopoly, things that generally play quicker, more straightforward, not a whole lot of rules to learn um, and more luck based. Uh, if those are your favorites, this is probably not the game for you. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope it was helpful for you in figuring out whether you want to try Gloomhaven or not. Um, if you do decide to buy the game, I would highly, highly suggest getting an organizer which isn't really needed to play the game, but it makes it so much easier to set up and break down. And I would say if you don't have a place to sort of set up the game and leave it permanently set up, it's almost a requirement to get some kind of organizer just to make the game 
set up a bowl in any reasonable amount of time. So if you are deciding to go that way, I'd also suggest you can check out my review of all the different Gloomhaven organizers out there and see which one might be a good fit for you. There's a link to that below. Thanks for watching.